I'm going to draw from 20 years odd of doing arts work with intergenerational groups. So I work a lot doing performance work and writing work in community settings, but I've got a particular interest in working across generations. And intergenerational arts work is work where there's been a choice to bring together people of different generations to work on a project. So it's not an accidental thing, it's a real, it's a real intentional choice. And there's a kind of background to that in terms of the way that the world works now. So in the Northern Hemisphere and in places like Australia, in the wealthier countries of the world, there's a growing older population. So there's a, a bigger older population than a younger population. So there's a, a real challenge in terms of the numbers of older people and what older people are doing post work. In England and Wales, one in six people now are over 65, and that's growing. So as well as numbers, there are some difficulties associated with aging. There's increasing isolation of older people. Uh, mobility and uh, changes in work patterns and in globalization mean that many, many more people move during their lifetimes and they end up not living near to close members of family. And even in areas where there's extreme poverty, research shows that one of the greatest problems for older people is isolation. In addition to this, there's a feeling that something goes wrong if generations are not communicating with each other, are not speaking to each other. And in fact, there's been some research into why, as one of many mammals, human beings keep women alive after they can have babies, because a lot of mammals don't. The female dies once she's had babies. And what the research is showing at the moment is that our social relationships are far too complex to be managed by parents and by peers. And you, did, you need a much bigger social grouping, a much bigger generational spread to actually manage the real complexity of social relationships. So if we finish with that one, I think it's really great to think about the, the fact that actually meeting across generations is because we need each other, because we've got so much to offer one another. I've seen lots of different models of intergenerational work, and uh, one of them might be young people going into a day center or a residential home, sometimes to entertain. Sometimes it might be because of the stories that the older people might have from a particular period in history. And there are some really, really good models of practice, but I've always had a bit of a niggle with that way of working. And for me, the reason is that it sets up a model where there's a donor and a recipient. So there are people entertaining and people being entertained, or there are people telling stories and other people listening. And I got very, very interested in the idea that there was another way to work together intergenerationally. And uh, the reason I've picked this image is that I feel that if we're going to approach one another, we have to be really careful that the question that we ask of the other person who we're talking to isn't too tiny, isn't a rather small door. So that if I say to a person of 16, you must like rap, I haven't left them much room for manoeuvre if they don't like rap. And if I say to somebody who's 70, what are your memories of the Second World War without noticing that they would have been barely a baby when the Second World War ended, I've given them a very small door of opportunity to make contact with me. So there's a kind of assumption that older people, particularly older people who are using day centers, who are in nursing homes, are going to want to talk about the past. And there's an assumption that younger people are going to want to talk about the future. And there's a real difficulty right there, because actually, if you look at our value systems, almost everything that we value, we value because of what it's going to bring in the future. 
So it's really great that this has happened because it's increasing somebody's confidence for the future, somebody's qualifications for the future. It's what's going to happen afterwards. So if you're working with people with whom you only talk about the past, you've got a bit of a problem. Now, it seemed to me that there was something really, really important that could go on in between these two sets of assumptions. And of course, the first way of cracking it is to remember that lots of young people absolutely love reminiscing, love remembering. And lots of older people absolutely love talking about the future and imagining the future. So it seemed to me that the main thing to do was to start changing the questions and seeing if it was possible to open up a kind of really mutually accessible territory where younger and older people could much more fruitfully meet together and work together and make things happen together. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things we've tried out in order to do that. And this thing about good questions was really, really at the heart of good arts practice. So trying to remove from the practice the questions which framed everybody in terms of their age was really, really helpful. And it made me so aware of what shorthand a number can be. So often I heard myself, I heard other people say, oh yes, but they're 70. Oh, but she's only 14. As if that meant something. And I think the more you get to know anybody, the more you understand that the number of years they've reached is not going to tell you an awful lot about them. And yet it's become a really habitual way of referring to the stages that we go through in life. I heard yesterday a program on the radio where uh, a music producer was being described and uh, we discovered that he was a bully, that he had a massive ambition to make as much money as possible as he could from the musicians who he produced. But actually, what did they tell you about him? They said the musicians didn't like him because he was older than them. And I, again, I had this sense of how easy it is to slip into language which makes an assumption about age and a set of other qualities coming together in a package. So in the work that I do, which is mostly in Tower Hamlets in East London, and is m the majority of the work that I've been doing over the last 10 years is just with women, with young women and older women meeting together. We try to find ways in that will help us to open up the territory. And three years ago, we were making a, a, an audio piece, a, a guided walk around our hamlets for the Lift Festival, and we wanted to discover stories about love. And quite quickly in the project, we had a sense that the young people were deferring all the time to the older women in the group. And they said to us, well, they've lived longer, and therefore, they know more about love. So I thought, well, I wonder if that's true. I wonder if you, if, because you live longer, you know more about love. I'm not sure that's true. So the first thing that we did was we put up uh, A to Z on the wall, and we said, let's find out how many words we know about love. So we just brainstormed, and we collected lots and lots of words about love. And there are a few of them uh, here. Virtuous Zoom, whatever that means, snogging, lots of things. And what unfolded by doing all these words was that the young women began to enter the room much more confidently because they realized that love was about friendship and love was about family and love was about place and love was about political passion and love was about romance and love was about heartbreak. And by unfolding the word into all its possibilities, all the participants came fully into the room because, of course, they all had stories. And this arena in which we are telling each other our stories and listening to each other's stories is exactly the arena where we can get rid of those rather narrow doors where the very question that we've asked has already made an assumption 
about somebody's age and their experience. And the territory is completely opened up to share these stories. The next exercise which we did with that group was we started to collect stories. And we asked them if they could give a story a time, a year. Did they remember when something had happened? So they collected stories from each other on post-its, which might have a year and then say, this is when my child was born, this is when my nephew was born, this is when I, when I went uh, for the first time on a, a pilgrimage, this is uh, when my husband died, uh, this is when my dad uh, uh, first praised me and I felt fantastic all sorts of stories from the group, and we put them up along the wall in a timeline. So they ran chronologically. And of course, there was a much bigger cluster where the girls' lives uh, had, had started and finished, and they went far beyond that for the older people. So the first thing we were seeing was a kind of chronological picture of the group. But then we said to them, which of these post-its match each other? Where do they connect? And the group then started to move the post-its out of their timeline and put them together. So all the stories about births got put together. And then we had another look at them and we said, let's put all the stories about loss together. And that included a wallet and a husband and a home country. And really before their eyes, they began to understand that they were not a chronological group. They were a group of individuals whose stories could cluster together in all sorts of different formations. The next exercise I'm going to tell you about is one that we did on a project which was about breaking the rules. And I was working with a wonderful puppeteer, and she taught us a drinking game, which is called Never Have I Ever. I don't know if you've done it. You say, you lift your glass, and you say, Never Have I Ever um, got on the tube without a ticket and cheated. And anybody else who's done the same as you lifts their glass and had a drink. We didn't use drink for anybody who's worried about the health and safety of the groups with whom I work. We used biscuits, so we had some nice big biscuits, and something extraordinary began to happen because the group uh, of young women had just met a woman who they knew was a justice of the peace, and she lifted her biscuit and she said, never have I ever stolen money from my husband's wallet. And then they saw quite a few of the other adults pick up their biscuits and take a bite as well. And then one of them said, uh, never have I ever completely ignored what a policeman told me to do and several other people did the same and we began with laughter but we ended with discovering a lot of very difficult shared stories because the woman who stole from her husband's wallet did so when he'd been drinking very heavily and uh, usually hit her when he got home and that uh, meant that one of the young women talked about having had to go to a shelter for people who were victims of domestic violence. And the connectivity emerged out of a really fun and interesting game because what was being revealed in the room was the humanity of the group. And the stories sometimes really connect. So a young woman who had decided that she no longer believed in the, the faith that her family followed and that she was going to actively leave it and tell her parents, talked to an adult who had married out of her faith community as a young woman whose father hadn't spoken to her for 20 years, and they, they spoke about this choice, this choice of leaving your faith community. Sometimes people found something where they had a kind of different but colliding interest. So a young woman and an older woman read to the group a section of Anne Frank's diary. One of the women was 14. She was the same age as Anne Frank. One of the women was Jewish, the same faith as Anne Frank. So they met together through this story. And sometimes they simply found that laying their stories down next to each other's was a way of really celebrating everything that went on in that room. Thank you. 
So the space that I'm really interested in is not the one where we confirm the stereotypes about us. And it's very, very easy in this kind of work to do work which actually just makes people leave the room feeling even more of an old person or more of a young person or more of a mum or more of an activist because <coughs> what you do all the time is you keep reinforcing that aspect through the work that you're offering but equally people do it for themselves we can easily enter new situations and decide to perform a certain identity but actually the place that is incredibly rich is this space that is really in between. And with another group that I work with, a group uh, of primary age children and theatre students and older people from a Jewish daycare centre, we said to them right at the beginning of the project, we know that everybody in this room has got something to teach us and we want you to think what it is. And they made a great big list and in the performance that we made, uh, they, they uh, gave this list to the audience. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of it. So they said to the audience, there is so much that you could learn from us. We can teach you respect, loving kindness, and how to make a boat out of a newspaper. We can teach you machining, patience, how to yodel, and how to take control of your nerves. We can teach you how to stop somebody waking up your baby nephew. And we can teach you how to make the best roast dinner, how to speak bee language, how to accessorize. And we are going to teach you new songs. And the wealth of experience in that group, nobody being the expert and delivering to somebody else, but a truly shared and rich experience together. Thank you. So I'm thinking about uh, when I was preparing this, why do I keep going back to this work? And what, what is it about this work that excites me? And I think that the word that continually returns for me is surprise, because I keep getting surprised by people because I am not saying that because I think so much about this work that I don't also walk into a room full of assumptions and constantly people shift my assumptions. The person I didn't expect to be prepared to do a solo dance on Brick Lane does a solo dance on Brick Lane and is filmed and I hope will shortly be on YouTube. Uh, for the Older people, one day a young woman said to them, I really miss how I used to look. And one of them said, no, that's what I'm meant to say. If other people really surprise you in that way, the massive benefit is that you then are much more capable of surprising yourself about yourself, of taking risks, of becoming much more creative, of not being scared of people who seem to be a little bit different to you. And I think that this work is really beautiful, it's really joyful, I get loads out of it, but I think at the moment it's very, very important that we resist rigid identities. And one of the girls said to the women, I didn't expect to have anything in common with you, but then you're not what I expected. Thank you.